Think Forward. Think Research Channel. If we look at every measure of our planet's environment, we're losing. We're losing more biodiversity. We're losing against the fight against global warming. As much as we might like to think these are getting better, they're not. Environmental problems in the 21st century are huge problems. Things like climate change affect the entire planet. Unfortunately, every year we have a bigger problem than we did last year. So whatever we're doing right now isn't enough. Business as usual is not working. So we need to really just break the mold and think of business as unusual. We want to find solutions. We want to find what we can do about these problems. And I think, to me, that is the really unique and very exciting uh, perspective that the Institute on the Environment provides. We're in the upper Midwest. We're in what a lot of folks consider to be the flyover territory. Well, the flyover territory is often where a lot of the best ideas have come from in American history. We have uh, three different major ecoregions right here in the state. It also is very diverse in how we use these ecosystems. We have land use change, we have agricultural practices that are changing, we have habitat destruction, the loss of species, all these forces uh, can be studied here and understood here. By having the capacity to do research right in our own backyard, we can answer questions locally, do the research locally, but it translates globally. In addition, we have a university that is uniquely broad. We have expertise in engineering. Humanities, social sciences. Atmospheric chemists. Applied sciences. Soil scientists. Medicine. Policy and law. Architects, designers. Journalism. Agriculture. It's all in one comprehensive university. There are only a handful of those around the world that really can do that, and especially of this caliber. If you combine all of that, we have uh, the potential to address environmental issues from um, the beginning question all the way to their solution. What the Institute on the Environment is going to let us do is to bring these people together to form multidisciplinary teams. And really simultaneously address human concerns alongside environmental concerns. The vision for the Institute on the Environment for the University of Minnesota is to be world class and recognized as one of the premier institutes or centers for the study of the environment. We have a very good team of scholars, scholars that are asking the big questions, the big global questions that are of interest to other scholars around the world and therefore we're having a large impact. I think you're going to see a lot more publicity, a lot more public notice about this institute. There's a real passion and a real expectation that this is going to succeed and it's going to really take off. The glass looks a little half empty sometimes because of all the problems we have, but in other ways it's overflowing with new ideas and new opportunities to solve the very problems that face us today. Places like Minnesota need to be the places that help stand up and solve some of these problems for the future. The biofuel stories now have gotten so polarized that you're either with us or against us. You know, it does become black or white. Having headlines say there can be some problems with making biofuels some way would have been great. Instead, they basically said all biofuels are bad, which is not at all the case. There are ways to make biofuels that have benefits and ways that don't. And what society has to do is make sure that the ones that, that are made for us are the ones that actually give us benefits. Our main point was you really ought to pay attention to how you produce the biofuels, not that biofuels are good or bad in and of themselves. In a broad sense, there are, there are two kinds of biofuels. One kind are biofuels that we derive from our current food crops, and that's the kind we're making right now. The shortcomings are it takes a lot of energy to grow the corn, to grow the soybeans. It takes a lot of energy to convert those into usable energy sources. When you're done with all of that, 80% of the energy in that gallon of ethanol is fossil energy it took to make the fertilizer, to grow the corn, to transport the corn, and convert the corn into ethanol. Only 20% of each gallon is new energy. We're not getting a very good return on our energy investment. The second major kind of biofuels are biofuels that are made from perennial plants, from long live plants that we can go out and harvest on, on a regular basis. And you can convert that by a, a series of modern processes into a liquid fuel. You can make ethanol out of it, you can make synthetic gasoline out of it, synthetic diesel. 
most people believe that within five or so years, we'll have commercially viable ways to take hay or wood chips or a high diversity mixture of prairie grasses, take that biomass, mow it, cut it, whatever, uh, and convert it into liquid fuels. Almost all the energy that you get out is actually new, non-fossil energy, renewable energy. So we're really trying to think about um, taking account of all of the costs associated with consequences of producing and using various fuels, you know, what's really in society's best interest. So that means taking account of the costs of the labor and the you know, equipment and so forth, but also taking account of the environmental costs. So including you know, what effect does this have on carbon emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions. We need not just more energy, we need energy that doesn't have greenhouse gas impacts. And the biofuels made from perennial plants have very low greenhouse gas impacts. In fact, some of them, we showed, are actually what are called carbon negative. At the end of the whole life cycle, you have less carbon dioxide in the air than you had at the start of it. We're having about, um, no, it's about a ton and a half of carbon dioxide removed from the air every year by these plants, it becomes organic matter in their roots, and those roots are shed, uh, and, and that uh, organic matter slowly builds up in the soil. Prairie lives basically forever. If, once you plant it, you can harvest it year after year after year. You do not need to replant it. It's a very stable ecosystem that can be harvested every year with no trouble. Because of the carbon dioxide that is taken by the plants that's stored in the soil, in the whole life cycle of this fuel, there is less greenhouse gas in the air when you're done making it and burning it than there was beforehand. In addition to that, there's a lot of waste biomass that is not being used. We have a lot of paper that right now goes into landfills that we could separate and use to make biofuels. We actually have a lot of manure that isn't being used uh, as it could be. That manure actually has a lot of energy in it. That could also be made into biofuels. We think we can probably have two times the energy coming from waste that we can get from dedicated energy crops and degraded land. If Producing biofuels involves a lot of clearing of forests or native prairies. That's where you're going to get what we call the carbon debt. If you produce the biofuels from waste uh, material, we're not clearing land. We're getting a valuable product um, that can be used to replace fossil fuels, and there it's just pure gain. Although there's a lot more work to be done in these kinds of issues, there, there's an immense potential with, with further research and, and some creativity uh, to have us uh, start solving the uh, global climate change kinds of issues through these kind of approaches. Energy and the environment will really be one of the fundamental challenges that society faces over the next 50 years. We can't just say we need energy. We need energy that gives us environmental benefits at the same time. In the end, we're going to have to have uh, a predominance on renewable energy sources. We're going to have to have a sustained push to get these renewables to replace um, conventional fossil fuels. I think these are problems that will be solvable. I don't see any issue with solving these problems. Um, I just hope that we start trying to solve them very soon. We had this long-term experiment at Cedar Creek where we've been growing uh, prairie grasses by themselves and then in various combinations. It's a biodiversity experiment. We're trying to find out, uh, do changes in the number of species living in an ecosystem, which are changes in biological diversity, do those affect how that ecosystem functions? One of our species uh, that we grew by itself as well as in mixtures was switchgrass. And switchgrass became famous as the energy grass of the future. But I kept looking at my experimental plots, and I have switchgrass growing in plots, and next to it I have a plot planted with 16 species, and I'd look at them, and the 16 species plots were always much, much more productive than, than switchgrass by itself, or than any of the things growing by themselves. We had 238% more energy produced on average in plots with 16 species, plots with biodiversity compared to switchgrass growing by itself. A huge difference, a huge premium uh, in yield and the energy you can get off, uh, off an acre of land. And we can take advantage of the benefits of biological diversity on productivity, on stability, on storing more carbon in the soil and making the biofuel actually have a better greenhouse gas signature than if it didn't, wasn't growing in, in high diversity plots. Another thing we're trying to find out uh, is um, how might we put um, let's say high diversity biofuel crops on a farmer's landscape. Are there some places where they actually do the farmer more good and society more good? 
we are finding out whether or not high diversity mixtures might be able to capture the nutrients that would say flow off a cornfield downslope or flow off a soybean field downslope. Might be able to capture those, causing the biofuel crop to actually give you higher yields because of those nutrients, but having them actually capture them in a way which keeps them out of the groundwater and keeps them out of lakes, rivers, and streams. If that's so, it might be that we'll go to a model of agriculture where you have uh, some land uh, that's a bit higher land that'll be farmed to soybeans and corn with a very large buffer strips around it of, of uh, bioenergy crops, high diversity mixtures of species, say, which are then a sink that can absorb uh, the nutrients, and we're even looking at whether they can absorb some of the pesticides or other chemicals uh, that, uh, that that come off of agricultural landscapes. These are sort of off the wall ideas. They may work, they may not work, but we're trying to find out. Um, if there can be some synergy, some ways that we can sort of make a landscape that can uh, provide us with a whole variety of benefits. Lake Superior is the cleanest, clearest, and coldest of North America's Great Lakes. It contains three quadrillion gallons of water. That's a three with 15 zeros after it. And the lake itself is about the size of the state of Maine. Lake Superior could hold water from all of the other Great Lakes and still have room for three more Lake Eries. Yet with all of the hard facts we have about this large lake, scientists are still trying to figure out its inner workings, including how the lake is responding to climate change. Lake Superior is big, it's cold, it's, it's fairly inaccessible or it has been historically, and there's lower population in the basin. So it has received less attention than the other Great Lakes. Because we don't have a lot of information, it means that we don't have a, a good sense of how the lake really functions over time. So in order to really understand what the impacts of climate change are going to be down the road, um, we need to understand some of the fundamental processes. Lucinda Johnson, a founding fellow of the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment, is teaming up with colleagues at the Large Lakes Observatory and Minnesota Sea Grant to address the environmental challenges facing Lake Superior. What we were able to show pretty conclusively is that Lake Superior is warming, and at least in the summertime. Um, that's the only time we measure the temperature is in the summer. The summer water temperatures are increasing much faster than we would have anticipated. They're rising about twice as fast as the local air temperatures are rising. The air temperatures are rising here faster than other places, and then the water temperature is rising even faster than that. Every warmer winter, we're getting less ice, and we will have less ice over time, and so we have this acceleration of warming of our lakes. Ice is very reflective. It reflects most of the energy back into space, whereas um, liquid water absorbs most of the energy. If you have a tendency to have less and less ice, then the water absorbs more and less, more energy and you reinforce the tendency to have less and less ice. This immediately has consequences, for example, in the fisheries because fish are very sensitive to temperature, often determines their growth rates often determines which fish can be in the system. Virtually all chemical and biological processes are temperature dependent. So if you change the temperature, you're going to change the, anything from the rate of photosynthesis of algae to the rate of decomposition of organic matter. Uh, we have a, what we call a cold water fauna in our Great Lakes primarily, um, and we have a lot of cold water, but we're going to have less of it. Working together across disciplines is critical to uncovering new information about climate change. Through creative collaborations and cutting-edge research, scientists like Hecke, Coleman, and Johnson are beginning to solve the mysteries of Lake Superior and of the Great Lakes in general. If we unravel the Lake Superior shoreline into a highway, it would extend 1,826 miles. That's the distance from Duluth, Minnesota to Miami, Florida. But despite its large size, the shoreline is just one small part of a highly complex system, one that extends far beyond the lakeshore community. And the effects of climate change, mixed with the impacts of human activity, are turning that system on its head. The temperature impacts are caused because we remove streamside vegetation in some cases, so the stream water warms up more. 
Uh, we also add impervious surfaces, parking lots and roads and rooftops, and when rainfall hits those surfaces, they warm up quite a bit. And so then when they get into our streams, it warms the stream up. And we've seen temperature jumps of 10, 12 degrees over five or 10 minutes in our streams after a rainfall event because of those warm waters running off of parking lots and other impervious surfaces. Up to the point where the trout in those streams would be severely impacted. The other prediction is that we're going to have larger storm events or more frequent large storm events. And so those bigger storms are going to also bring more water into our streams. That extra volume is going to just increase the erosion. Instead of water getting trapped on the land, it runs right off into our streams very quickly. And those huge volumes of water basically remake the stream channels and rip out the banks and pull that sediment into the streams and carry that sediment downstream, smothering habitat, harming the fish directly. Uh, carrying extra nutrients, carrying a little bit of mercury. Sediment in, a water col in the water column is a stressor for fish. It gets into their gills, it, it makes it difficult for them to see. Sediment also carries with it nutrients, so that means that you're um, bringing in a much higher amount of nutrient along with the sediment, so that um, causes algal growth to increase. People tend to clear um, the vegetation away from the shoreline just because they're interested in seeing a view of the lake. If you remove the trees, you get more heating um, at the ground level. So removing vegetation, especially when you substitute uh, paved surfaces or rooftops, that tends to disrupt the hydrologic cycle. The initial response for most uh, homeowners is to say, I don't live right on the lake, so what I'm doing isn't going to affect Lake Superior. A lot of uh, work is being conducted now to try and, and understand how it is that you get the message to people about how what they're doing in their piece of land influences what happens downstream and ultimately Lake Superior. Many of the things that we have to do to deal with the problems of stormwater and nonpoint pollution that we have right now are also going to help us adapt to the changes that we expect for climate change. Things like rain garden and planting more trees and keeping our forests in place so when those big storm events come in they don't have as great an impact on our streams. All of the things that we have to do for stormwater are also going to help us adapt to climate change, which is even more impetus, I think, for working with communities to help them get their stormwater issues figured out as soon as possible. Lakes exist on every continent on Earth, including Antarctica. These lakes are present in different climates and habitats and face a diverse set of threats. By thinking about these systems in a global sense, we can better understand the lakes closer to home. Researchers at the University of Minnesota's Duluth campus are comparing data from Lake Superior with data from East Africa and other parts of the world. They're starting to answer some tough questions about the impacts of climate change on the Great Lakes. Now one of the things that's very similar between Superior and uh, these large African lakes is that we are seeing them warm up. Uh, over the past century, Lake Superior has warmed up um, two and a half degrees centigrade. But in Lake Tanganyika and in Lake Malawi, we see a similar uh, uh, warming trend in the surface waters of the lake. What happens when those lakes warm up? These are already the warmest lakes in the world. They're starting to move into new territory, and if some of the climate projections hold, they may warm by three to five degrees Celsius, that's six to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than they are now. The surface waters warm more than the deep waters, and so when that happens, you have this very warm light water overlying cooler, denser water. That density stratification gets stronger, and that means that you don't have as much mixing of deep water up and shallow water down. We're getting less mixing with deep water. And that deep water holds the nutrients that keep the surface waters productive. That changes the delivery of nutrients to the photic zone. That changes the biology. It, it, it cuts back the productivity of the lake. We're reducing nutrient inputs. We're likely reducing the fish production in those lakes on which millions of people literally depend. Lake Malawi provides 90% of the protein for the people of Malawi. So these large African lakes are exceedingly important to the people who live around them. 
there are no alternatives for those people. So we're immediately beginning to affect the livelihoods and the well-being of millions of people in Africa. Now these uh, African Rift Lakes have kilometers of sediment underlying the lake floor, four kilometers of sediment. This sediment carries a record of the history of the lake, of the history of the climate around the lake, the history of the ecosystem around the lake. And so uh, shortly after I started working on the African lakes, I started taking sediment cores and analyzing them for evidence of past climate change. And I've done similar work on Lake Superior. So we can go back and look into lake sediments. And what we see are often very dramatic transitions in microfossil communities that we can only uh, understand and explain by changes in climate. We're trying to figure out, can we predict when the next major droughts are coming and when the next major floods are coming? Can we do that on, say, a decade by decade scale? We're actually making comparisons between our records uh, from the sediment cores of the East African lakes with the ice cores from Greenland and the ice cores of Antarctica. We're putting together a global pattern of climate variability. We are constantly thinking in terms of um, the dynamics of Lake Superior in this temperate latitude setting and comparing that with the dynamics of Lake Tanganyika or Lake Victoria in a tropical setting. But now we have a very open-ended question. What will climate mean to these lakes? And I'm afraid that we don't have ready answers for that. And that's where we're working here, I think, very aggressively to try to provide some of those answers. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.